Hello and welcome to this week's 1829 talk. Uh, you're very welcome. I am Professor Annie Tindley uh, and it's my honour to be one of the trustees uh, of the Natural History Society of Northumbria and to be introducing these 1829 series of talks to you. Um, the 1829 talks um, highlight and celebrate uh, the year of our foundation uh, as a society, as one of the oldest uh, and most honourable uh, natural history societies uh, in Britain. And the purpose of these talks is to allow a platform and showcase uh, for the most exciting and cutting edge new research being undertaken by our early career researchers. So they're here really to, to share with us the latest findings in environmental research. As such, I hope you enjoy uh, this week's talk um, and I could urge you, if you can, to follow us on social media, uh, Natural History Society uh, of Northumbria, and enjoy the talk. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this 1829 talk with the Natural History Society of Northumbria. I'd just like to quickly say thank you so much for having me. My name is Rebecca Puttick. I'm a PhD student at Newcastle University and I've just started my PhD working in the Modelling Evidence and Policy Group, uh, which is within the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences. Uh, I'm going to present to you some work that I completed for my Master's at the University of Oxford. Um, so another quick thank you to the School of Geography and the Environment for funding this research. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my work, which is looking at the Pleistocene Park, which is an ongoing rewilding experiment based out in Ucutia, which is Siberia. Uh, now, I'm currently working within the field of tropical ecology, so it's been a bit of a change in terms of the types of ecosystems and species that I work with. Uh, however, what links my past and current work is the use of remote sensing methods for research and the goal or kind of focus of ecosystem restoration. So I'm just going to start off by giving a bit of background information about rewilding and more specifically Pleistocene rewilding at the park and try to set the scene about what the work there is hoping to achieve and explore. Then following this, I'll go into some more specifics about my research and the results I obtained and kind of round off by giving some discussion points um, about what the implications of these results are. So a quick bit of scene setting first. Um, it's no secret that human impacts upon the natural world um, have in places become absolutely devastating. And these impacts are now so great that the challenges facing ecosystems and biodiversity have been proposed to encompass a new geological epoch, and that's been referred to as the Anthropocene. And in recent history, we've seen a huge increase in the application of the Anthropocene um, as a means of framing and contextualising the dominating presence of humans uh, within Earth systems. And this framing has given rise to new approaches in conservation science, uh, one of which many of you will have heard of, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, and that's rewilding. And rewilding has emerged as an ambitious potential solution to global environmental issues. Uh, however, it was originally tied up in ideas of preserving so-called big wilderness, uh, carnival species, keystone species. Um, but since then, the concept has uh, developed substantially. So there's loads of literature out there about rewilding. Um, today, I'm just going to concentrate solely on Pleistocene rewilding, which is a branch of rewilding that aims to restore ecosystem functioning to a Pleistocene baseline. So what does this mean? Um, well, generally, generally speaking, it means that scientists are aiming to restore or recreate systems that were lost following the Pleistocene extinctions. And this was a mass extinction event globally, um, saw the loss of many mammal species, megafaunal species over 40 kilograms. Um, and there's a few hypotheses as to why this is. Um, but before we go into that, it's just important to highlight how this adds a new dimension to the concept of rewilding. Um, and that is that specifically attention's being drawn to the restoration of missing ecological functions of lost megafauna. And in this, a crucial idea is that Pleistocene systems, um, they functioned largely independent of human influence. And so that's why they kind of held of this as a gold standard in terms of their functioning um, and as a goal for restoration. Um, so at the Pleistocene Holocene transition, when these extinctions occurred, um, there was also biome level vegetation changes. And this is what Pleistocene rewilding focuses on. Um, but in interestingly, because many of the species are extinct, the process requires the use of surrogate species. Um, so, for instance, the woolly mammoth no longer exists. And so there's inherently a focus on the processes and functions that animals and plants serve within their environment. So although there's a lot of literature surrounding rewilding, there's actually not many physical examples of this being carried out in real life. 
Um, and one of the few projects that is trying to establish empirical evidence for rewilding is the Pleistocene Park. And this is a project that's being led by Russian scientists Sergei and Nikita Zimov. Um, and the park began with some initial grazing experiments and has since progressed through a series of stages of rewilding experiments. And these have been set up to test the hypothesis that repopulating the landscape with large herbivores and hopefully um, eventually introducing predators in the system too. Um, they hope that this can restore rich grassland ecosystems that were once widespread throughout the region. So there's a few key ideas that are being tested here and I'll briefly try and tease them apart in the next slide. So the first aim of the park is centred around the hypothesis that megafaunal extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene era um, were due to human overhunting and this work builds on a hypothesis which is known as the overkill hypothesis. So without these herbivore species grazing on the vegetation, trampling the vegetation in the landscape, uh, mosses, shrubs and trees were able to take over and replace the grassland that dominated these ecosystems. So if the grasslands were destroyed because of herbivore extinctions, then it's believed that those landscapes can be recreated by the rewilding of appropriate herbivore communities. So the key concept is that animals, rather than climate, maintained ecosystem structure during the Pleistocene. And so rewilding large herbivores Siberia can initiate a feedback loop and promote the re-establishment of grasslands. Um, but why exactly is the focus on these grassland systems in the first place? Um, well, this ties into the second aim of the park. And the second aim of the park is to research the relationship between the grazing behaviour of large herbivores and the thawing of permafrost, and more broadly how this relates to global climate change. So this aim centres around the idea that herbivores can actually play a really vital role in slowing permafrost thaw and help to mitigate global warming. And there's a few concepts that underpin this, um, but a couple of key processes that I focused on during my study was the action of trampling by herbivores and the shift from woody to grassy vegetation types caused by grazing and browsing. So in terms of the trampling aspect, um, the idea is that snow on the ground becomes compacted from the animals walking around. Um, this provides less insulation to the ground and causes a deeper freeze of the underlying permafrost. And this slows the thawing of permafrost in the summer and prevents carbon from being released in the form of greenhouse gases. And the shifting from woody to grassy vegetation types, um, which is driven by herbivore grazing and browsing, that's hypothesized to increase surface albedo and higher albedos are associated with a net cooling effect on climate um, as less of the sun's energy is absorbed by the Earth's surface. So there's some really big research questions here um, and they're being investigated at the park and the work that I completed for my master's uh, mostly falls within the first aim here. So we're going to focus on that from here on out. So just another quick summary here, um, just to um, kind of reiterate that the aim I was focusing on was the park trying to recreate grassland systems that were once widespread throughout the region, but were lost, um, it's thought, due to megafaunal extinctions. So the park has been using rewilding approaches to try and recreate these grasslands. And my research looked at the vegetation and land cover changes at the park through time using remote sensing methods. Um, so I wanted to look at whether the park had been successful, basically, in trying to reestablish these grassland systems. Um, so very briefly, uh, remote sensing methods, what are those? Um, remote sensing methods, it just refers to collecting data or information about an object or phenomenon um, without making physical contact uh, or perhaps even being physically there in person to collect the data. And there's loads of different types of remote sensing methods and approaches. For my research, I chose to concentrate on using satellite images um, and I use satellite images of the Earth to gather information and make inferences about land cover changes. And this is a really cool approach that I learned to use um, last year and actually a lot of techniques that I learned um, were through platforms such as YouTube or Facebook. Um, and during a pandemic, it was really um, good to have this kind of access to these techniques. Um, I did all of this research from my family home. Um, I think it just goes to show how even these um, kind of seemingly advanced approaches are actually quite accessible. Um, there's tons of free open source satellite imagery out there and you can use and analyse it and yeah it's actually surprisingly straightforward to work with and get some interesting results from. Um, so the Pleistocene Park has reported um, in some of their studies that grass has become the dominant vegetation type in the rewilding area and this suggests that the grazing, browsing, trampling pressures of the animals has had the desired effect and this is where my work comes in. So I wanted to see whether I could remotely look at the vegetation changes in this area of the park and essentially provide further evidence that the experiments were working and provide evidence to support Pleistocene rewilding practice. 
So just to briefly explain how I selected my satellite imagery for my study, I'll give a quick timeline on what's happened at the park um, since the experiments began. The first rewilding experiment uh, was established in 1996, and that was a 40 hectare area that was fenced off and rewilded with Yakutian horses and moose and reindeer. Um, but even though the park covers a much larger area now and there's some different study areas, um, I just focus primarily on this 40 hectare area um, because this is the area that's had the kind of focused rewilding efforts on it. Um, so the satellite imagery that I needed to select, uh, it needed to serve as a baseline for land cover changes and vegetation types. So I needed to kind of get a before and after picture of what happened. Um, and I actually ended up using declassified satellite imagery from the US government. And this was collected during the Cold War era. So I needed to get data um, before 1996, before this fenced area was there. Um, but the problem with satellite imagery is that a lot of it is quite limited. Um, but yeah, luckily for me, the, the Cold War meant there was lots of satellites um, over Russia. And um, the imagery that I actually ended up acquiring was ex-American um, military and American intelligence agency imagery. So amazingly, these images were taken on film cameras um, and then released back to Earth in little capsules that are then retrieved. And um, yeah, these film images have uh, been digitalized now and are available online. Um, now they've been processed and um, georeferenced. Um, so yeah, so I use these images as my baseline images. So that was data from 1965 and 1980. And then in addition to this, um, I purchased some very high resolution satellite imagery at 20 to 30 centimeter resolution, uh, which is really interesting to look at. Um, and also some open source imagery from a platform called Planet, uh, which is a really great resource if you're a researcher looking for free satellite imagery. Um, they have a really good kind of research and education scheme for getting satellite imagery. Um, so yes, that set up my timeline. I had data from 1965 through to 2020 to look at. So um, I've just popped this map and image here so you can see um, how I went about looking at the vegetation changes. So I used what's known as a supervised classification approach in ArcMap. Um, so you go through the images and you manually classify a set of training pixels corresponding to each uh, vegetation or land cover class. Um, and that allows the software to associate a spectral signature of each pixel with that land cover class based on its similarities to other pixels in that class. So very simply, um, you're telling the computer which colour matches with what land cover type. Um, for this kind of analysis anyway, you can make it more complex and add more attributes in, um, but I was just looking at the spectral signature. Um, so the box on the left gives you an idea of how I would have classified the image shown here. Um, I think this is the worldview imagery, which is a um, 30 centimetre resolution. Um, and yes, this works really nicely for high resolution multi spectral imagery like this. It's generally quite clear which land cover type is which, and the more training data you put in, the more accurate the classification tends to be. Um, but on the other hand, working with the data from 1965 and 1980, um, this kind of analysis was far more difficult. Uh, here is the film imagery, and although it's been digitalized, it's still panchromatic, which essentially just means it's lots of shades of black and grey. Um, and this made it really difficult to accurately classify land cover types at this spatial scale. Um, so we're concentrating on a 40 hectare area, which is really quite small. Um, and unfortunately for my study, although the approach of using this archival imagery was in principle quite sound um, and has been used by other researchers, um, in practice it just wasn't really possible to rely on this data at this spatial scale. And this was reflected in the poor producer and user accuracy values that I got when I was manually validating the land cover maps. Um, that the software produces based on the training data it inputted. Um, and essentially, this just means that it's hard to differentiate one patch of grey from another patch of grey. Um, there's a lot of spectral overlap between each land cover class here. In light of this, uh, we chose just to focus primarily on the very high resolution imagery that we purchased. Um, and we narrowed our time frame down to 2004 to 2012, which is where we had these high resolution images. Um, so we had three of these images that we looked at in sequence. And we focused our analysis on this essentially just because the classifications were more accurate and it made sense. It was more likely to be um, representative of what had actually occurred in real life. Um, but interestingly, looking at the results from this high resolution imagery, we could see that grass was the dominant vegetation type over time in the rewilded area of the park, although the trend in this change was non significant. Um, but the interesting part came from the change detection analysis. And that basically looks at what each pixel in the map has changed from and what it's changed to in terms of land cover class. 
Um, and through this analysis, you can see the appearance of a sort of diamond shaped region to the bottom side of the rewilded area. Um, I think it's shown in white there on the map. Um, and that kind of represents a distinct loss of forest or woody vegetation. But it's interesting to note the pattern here. It looks like tracks and appears almost too clear cut to be caused by the action of herbivores grazing and trampling. Um, it's yeah, it just kind of doesn't make sense that that's the only area that the animals would have acted in. So we had a chat with the park and they confirmed that this area of land had been subject to some mechanical efforts to remove this forested and woody vegetation. And this essentially involves them driving machinery into the trees, bringing the trees down and removing them. So there's a clear contribution of a mechanical effort to land cover changes here. And this leads me to my discussion of the study and rewilding efforts so far at the park. So the discussion points from this are kind of the key take home points. Um, firstly, is the difficulties associated with available data at suitable resolutions. Um, so we saw the difficulties of working with that historical black and white imagery and how it was really hard to kind of tell each land cover class apart. And that's kind of an inherent issue with data availability and especially when you're kind of setting up that timeline of land cover changes or land cover baselines before the rewilding started because there just isn't as much high quality data available for this time period. Um, secondly, uh, remote sensing methods may be inappropriate for fine scale land cover change detection. So we were only looking at 40 hectare area. That's a relatively small area. So maybe remote sensing methods aren't the most appropriate for this kind of resolution of um, or this scale of study. Um, thirdly, is the need to separate human and animal driven vegetation changes. So we looked at that in the previous slide with the change detection analysis. So there's a clear mechanical input there. I think it's really important for future research to be able to separate um, or attribute the relative contribution of each to vegetation changes. Um, next is maybe the time scale was too short. So the ecological time scale for land cover changes could be greater than the age of the park. Another consideration is that maybe rewilding has not been done at high enough density. So, you know, this is still in the early stages and um, it's not been scaled up yet. So perhaps that's the reason why the vegetation changes um, have required some mechanical inputs or maybe why herbivores aren't yet the sole driver of vegetation changes. And lastly, um, kind of more of a big picture question is maybe the role of herbivores is overstated in the first instance. So all of this work is built upon the hypothesis that herbivores can drive the vegetation dynamics of their ecosystem, but there are other um, hypotheses and theories out there and maybe those play a role too. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to finish off um, by saying that um, the Pleistocene Park is a really ambitious strategy um, for combating climate change. It's a really unique site and it's driven by really passionate people. Um, however, such experiments are few and far between, and as such, there's a real lack of empirical evidence as to how these projects are working, and also a lack of feasibility for scaling up these kind of projects. Um, but nevertheless, these projects are really important in the development of natural climate solutions, and as such, there's no doubt they'll serve as a really crucial resource for future research. And although remote sensing methods present some distinct challenges, um, it was a really interesting project to work on. And it's definitely helped to educate me in terms of the challenges of working with remote sensing data and the limitations of the methods. Um, and it also allowed me using satellite imagery to get a really good sense of the system that I was studying, despite the restrictions that were imposed due to coronavirus. Um, so as far as a desk based project goes, I think I was pretty lucky to get involved in this project. Um, and I'm really lucky that these techniques are something that can be self taught at home if you have access to a computer. Um, but yeah, on that note, I'd really like to thank my supervisor, Professor Mark Vasseas Faria, for his support and expertise with the whole process. And thank you to the Natural History Society of Northumbria for having me talk about this. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And any questions, feel free to email me or get in touch via Twitter.